Welcome to my podcast, What the Fuck Spirit. If you made it past that name, this is going to be the podcast for you. This is going to be a no holds barred, no bullshit, open and honest conversation with Maria Leggett, and that's me, about all things spiritual. It's time to begin talking in an open and honest way about what spirituality is and what it is not. We're going to discuss all things woo-woo, witchcraft, spiritual, queer spirituality, medium versus psychic, energy healing, light work, shadow work, and any other bullshit that people want you to believe because it keeps them comfortable. It is time for you to grow. Let's go. I find that tune so catchy. I can't help myself. I bounce a little with it. So my name is Maria Leggett and I am super excited to be on here today. This is pre-recorded because of the time difference. My guest today is living in Australia and I can't wait to talk to her. We have the beautiful and amazing Natasha Dordney and she considers herself, which I love, a witch and a feminine alchemist. I mean, seriously, feminine alchemy. That is amazing to me. And so we are literally just going to riff and just let things flow the way that they're supposed to go because this is kind of what we do. So without further delay, I'm going to bring on Natasha. Yay! Hello, my beautiful friend. How are you? Oh, I'm amazing. I'm probably going to be a sweaty mess by the end of this because we're having a really hot day here, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> you know, it's even 70 degrees here in the States, in Ohio. Like, I'm shocked. It should not be 70 degrees. It should be like 15. <laughs> Soak it up. Soak it up. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to describe in your own words, tell us all about yourself. Ah, oh, who am I? I am in my roles. I am a mother. I have four wild children who I am doing my best to open up space to learn how to be themselves in this world without me trying to condition and, and tame and make them into something which has... <laughs> So many challenges that I was not ready for because wild means pushing boundaries and mm. doing what they want and me having to learn which battles to pick. Um, I do that on my own as a solo mother. I, two, year, two, and, two and a half years ago, um, became a solo mother while my fourth baby was still in the womb. And a couple of years, well, a couple of weeks later, sorry, I free birthed him on my own and really truly claimed what it was to be a sovereign woman through that experience and I think that was a really important part of me stepping into solo parenting and and actually saying to myself yep yeah, you've got this you can try you know how to trust yourself you know how to pull up all your resources you know how to hold yourself and be there even when it feels really hard and challenging um that there kind of leads into I'm really passionate about women reclaiming their power I'm really passionate about women understanding what that's rooted into and where that comes from and how to activate it and integrate it in a way that we're using it in our everyday life. Like we're using it in those experiences mm -hmm. in the mundane, that it's not just about, about being a witch or a feminine alchemist in your own practice, and when you're behind closed doors or in your sacred space, but that you're able to hold that energy and understand how you're using that in your everyday living and in, in all of the, you know, from my enchanted coffee through to how I choose to rest and how I choose to have conversations and communicate with other people and um, how I choose to walk on the earth, how I choose to, to be here in the world. Um, I also, which probably feels quite flip side to the feminine element. I love my sport. I love to 
go and get in community and at the moment I'm, I'm playing soccer, I'm starting soccer for the first time, um, but I've played sports since I was a young girl and so I coach soccer, coach my son's team, all three of my kids play and I'm playing this year as well. Um, love to throw heavy shit around and feel my strength in my body and, you know, at Tough Club we drag tires and, and climb ropes and all that kind of stuff as well. So I have this kind of duality of that because I grew up on a farm and I loved climbing trees and mm. um, really being able to feel my strength to be able to do all the things I want to do in my life. I think that's, you know, it's that functional kind of place for me. So it's kind of like it doesn't really get seen a lot because I'm always talking about the feminine, but that's quite an important part of me as well. It's a part of me that I love to, that yeah, I love doing. And I spent 10 years as a personal trainer, so. Oh, my okay. gosh, I didn't know that. That's yeah. amazing. People don't know that, but that all feeds into the feminine as well because that's what's taught me about being able to work deeply with the body as well and understand on the scientific level what we're doing when it comes to like our embodiment and um, all those elements too. I yeah. love that. That's amazing. Yes. Absolutely amazing. Um, so I love that you were sharing all about Silas's birth because I loved being able to watch that and you posted so authentically and so beautifully your whole entire experience with him. So, I mean, it was just, it was a great way for people who didn't really know you to get to know how you had this beautiful inner strength. And it was just amazing to be able to witness and to be able to experience. And I was so grateful for that. So thank you for being able to share that beautiful, intimate piece of yourself to the rest of the world. Um, I love how you spoke about in your tell us about yourself, right? You talked about using all of this beautiful magic, even in the mundane. So what do you mean? I mean, I know what you mean, but I want you to be able to explain how you're using your magic, even in the mundane, because a lot of what you were talking about is living intentionally, like you're totally living intentionally, especially when you're talking about your cup, because I even have one, right? It says, not today, muggle fucker. <laughs> I love that. Because I almost my used my Harry Potter cup as well. <laughs> <laughs> So talk to me about how you're using your magic, even in the mundane. Yeah, I think a really big part of it for me is like understanding that I am the temple. I am the altar. I like to think of my body as the temple and my womb as my altar for creation. And when it comes to, you know, cooking food, um, at the moment I'm searching for a new home I've got a I've got to move so I'm looking for a new home it's like every time I'm standing in these homes that I'm looking at I'm thinking like how does this space serve me how does how would this space become my sanctuary like what would I feel like here when I'm having conversations with people I'm thinking about you know who am I choosing to be in this? How am I influencing the change I want to see in the world? Because a lot of the time when we're in our own personal practices, we're thinking about who we want to become. And I think when we take that into the world, it's about how does who I'm becoming influence the change I want to see in the world that supports me even more to be who I want to become? And so it's it's that, yeah, it's that intentionality. And if I'm the altar, if I am that moving temple, I'm energy constantly conversing with the energy and the environment that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And when you recognize how powerful the energy that was within your body, but also, you know, permeating the space and, and integrating with the space around you or mingling with the space around you, you realize how much you are influencing things with your yeah. magic, with your energy. And I think that's it there. Like it's not, you don't have to have, you don't have to be having all of the tools we might use in rituals or spells, but like your words are the spells that you're casting, right? Yeah. Yes. And I'm, you know, I catch myself when I'm, when I'm in my struggle zones as a parent, like I've been through this huge, huge journey with my eldest daughter 
where it's like, shit, like the spells I'm casting with her right now, the spells we're casting together are not serving us. And like, so that there I'm thinking like, how do I break that cycle? How do I, which is, you know, kind of a mundane element of life, right? Relationships and communication with family. And, you know, it's not a beautiful, it doesn't seem like a beautiful ritual, but when we create it into that, that's what starts to help us shift out of it and come to a higher perspective with it. And, you know, it's when I'm saying something to her, it's like, oh, shit, that's reflecting something at me. Did you hear yourself just then, what you said? Yeah. Um, And, like, it was like mirror. Like, I'm, you know, all of these things that we do on our own, like, they're happening in everything we do. And I think that's an important part is recognising magic is not just the tools and the spells and the structured, containered rituals, but it is everything. Yeah, absolutely. One of the one of the best definitions that I ever got was that magic is the manipulation of the general in- energy around you. Yeah. And it's people because the word manipulation has been misused for so long, it is more, you know, they think about manipulation in a bad way. But all you're doing is adjusting it to this is my this is my will, this is what I would like to do. And if you're doing it in the best interest of everyone involved, it's a it's a lighter, happier type of manipulation. And that's really all it is. You're just saying, here is what I am asking for. And I love how you said, you know, the spells that we're weaving together between you and your daughter, because their spells are literally just the words that we speak. And this is why I try to teach people that when they say, oh, I'm going to say a prayer, you're saying a spell literally. And a lot of people struggle with, because it's spelling for a reason, right? You're putting these letters <laughs> together because you want them to create an intention. And that intention becomes a word, which becomes something else. And that's all it is. The prayers are spells. How do you, how do you see that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And it was interesting, as you're saying, like putting these letters together, it was making me think of like bind runes and like where we're looking outside of like the mundane of like the letters, right, into um, we're trying to find something that seems more magical, but it's like everything is within everything that you've got. It's like taking that time to to bless and place intention into something, right? It's yeah. It's like I'm drinking this coffee, but I do this every day. That's actually a ritual. Yes. And if I be intentional with the energy I'm holding in myself while I'm doing that and add add a moment of words to build upon that, that's magic. Absolutely. Um, and I love this piece you said around like manipulation. It's like, yeah, well, whenever we want something to move towards what we desire, we are bending and shifting and shaping it. Absolutely. We are changing its form. Yeah. And that's all magic is. You're changing the form of where it started into something different. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's magic. It's alchemy. It's all that beautiful change and things that we can create by our words and our intentions and the way that we want things to go. And it's, um, it just like, it's, it's at that point where I have like no words. I can see everything in my head, but yeah. I have a hard time spitting it out. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, you can feel it, you know, and it's like you've just got to have it land because it's also the place of the unknown. And it's that where we don't actually have to have a full explanation for how it works. It's within the mysteries. It just does. It's true. It's true. Yeah. I love how you were talking about how, you know, I have my I have my coffee and this is my intention and it's a ritual that you have every day. Um, because I do the same thing. I have chai tea every morning or I have Earl Grey for a long time. It was chai tea. And when I'm drinking the chai tea, I set the intention of the spices that are in it, right? That there's the cinnamon that's in it. There's the ginger in it. And as I'm stirring it with a little bit of sugar so that there's some sweetness in my day, I always stir it to the right so that I'm going sunwise or clockwise because I want to bring that into my life. So I'm making a spell with my tea that I'm making every single morning to say, this is how I want my day to go. I want to, you know, invoke the cinnamon for protection. I want to bring in the ginger to spice up my life a little and a little bit of that black pepper. 
And it's all these small things, like you said, the mundane, right? That's how we can bring magic into the mundane. It's the intention that you set into it. And it's lovely to hear someone else chat about that in the exact same way, because that's how I feel about it. You're bringing it into the mundane and everything can be magical, no matter what it is. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's even like when we are, I mean, we're in the kitchen a lot with this, but, you know, when we're washing the dishes and we're cleansing away that last meal or when, you know, I notice some, sometimes if I'm feeling frustrated and I've started to cut the food to go into the cook and I'm like, you are feeling angry while you're making this food for yourself. Just take a moment. Wow. <laughs> like, Take a moment so that what you're putting through this knife is actually what you want to be eating, right? Yes, 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 yes. It's um, it's also one of the reasons why it becomes really important, depending on the kind of meat that you're eating, which is why we have so many people who are vegan or vegetarian, because not not all animals are killed humanely. Not all animals are thanked for their life before they were killed. And and I totally understand why people wouldn't want to be meat eaters. I, I get it because it's energy that goes into that processing that kind of changes everything. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And like, as you're saying that, like organic farming is a really um, great example of where there is intentionality. And I think, you know, if we're choosing practices that are designed to support and sustain the earth, like that comes through in the food. Yes. You know, and so the food tastes different. The food feels different in your body. It um, absolutely does. And that's one of the reasons why we here, um, <clears throat> we raise our own chickens. So we have our own eggs. We have our own chickens. However, our beef and our pork, we get from a local farm and he delivers it to us because we know what he does. We know what his farm looks like. We know his intention. We know that he thanks the animals for their energy before they're slaughtered, basically. And that makes me feel better. And the meat, you can taste the difference in the energy of what's put into it. Yeah. Yeah. It's so different. And, you know, I, I think a part of that for me was growing up on a farm, having our own yeah. home kill meat. And, you know, I also, you know, I saw the process right through I understood the fact that we're raising these animals I've you know watched my dad um, butcher them and you know and understanding what all that feels like in the space that they've got and because I was so connected to like I literally did not wear shoes unless I really had to like for sport or woodwork or something like that yeah. you know you you feel it and living here in Melbourne it's um I prefer to be vegetarian, but I do eat a little bit of meat because my children do. And it is, I'm just going to be honest here, like it's a convenience thing sometimes to only have to cook mm -hmm. one meal. Um, but I started eating meat more while I was pregnant with Silas. Before before that, it was really only maybe once a fortnight or um, once every three or four weeks. And I can feel the difference. And so I'm very conscious of, okay, what is this meat I'm eating right now? now and do I want like do I want to purchase that meat just to have meat or am I going to leave that on the shelf and only get it when I can get like the good stuff and it's mm -hmm. the same with the produce like all the produce here like in Perth um, that's in Western Australia I used to go to this little farmer's market every Sunday and probably 80% of our produce was organic or biodynamic or spray free and it just felt amazing. I was at my most vital, my energy when we were living there and having that amazing food was through the roof. Like I never mm -hmm. felt tired. And here in Melbourne, there is, well, not only we are covered by like this energetic murky dome of energy, but I can't afford to buy organic food like that. Like all our, most of our pantry yeah. stuff is organic, but the produce is it costs so much. Like I used to pay very similar to just conventional in Perth by going to the markets, but here there's not even a market close by for me to go to. Oh, wow. Um, you know, I've got to drive like 30, 40 minutes with four children. And it's not easy. It's just not, it's not a, um, yeah, it's just energetically, it's not something I can do right now. And I struggle with tiredness. I struggle with like 
sometimes it doesn't matter how much fruit and vegetables I've eaten. It's like, oh, I just don't feel like I can get to that state I was in before. And, you know, the food doesn't taste as good. And I had to get used to the food not tasting as good. Like my produce not tasting as sweet or flavorful or, yeah. um, you know, even the texture of it is different. It's firmer. It's more fibrous as opposed so to different. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, that's like alchemy that's taking place in our bodies, right? And we're just talking about the mundane here, but there's so much energetics behind that food that gets produced. I mean, it's why I love to garden because it teaches us so much about how to create and the energy and like what we put in is what comes out the other side and the fruits of it. Um, But like, that's just such a tangible example there of it is. energetics and manifestation and and what we like what the outcome is energetically for us i love that um all right i'm going to take two seconds and see if i can pull you out pull you back in because your video froze (laughs) expression (laughs) did it come back now i have no video come on video show me let me see if I can do something my end. Mm, I'll I just had to turn everything off and it back on. And then I was talking there telling you what I'm doing while I'm on mute. (laughs) (laughs) It's all good. It's all good. (laughs) Well, thank you for sharing so much. I, 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 it's great to hear someone else understand that the energy that we put into things, whether it's food, the mundane things like our coffee, our tea, it really does affect our bodies and how we move through the world. So the one question that I ask every guest who's on here is what does spirituality mean to you? (sighs) Such a beautiful question. Spirituality for me personally is the way that I choose to live my life with intentionality and awareness. It is this thought that well, or this remembering that it is not just about me and what I want, but how what I believe and value in influences the world. And a large part of spirituality, for, well, there's two sort of facets to this for me. One is um, the earth and really living, like coming back to living wholesomely, coming back to living in communion with the earth and understanding my practices through what she mirrors to me, through what she teaches me and understanding myself through that as well, especially as a woman with a womb. And then the other aspect of spirituality for me is creating that shift for collective change and healing the patterns that haven't served us and um, like I see uh, you know I see that breaking of patterns and um, shifting things into healthier um, more, more sustainable more nourishing ways like I see that as a part of my spirituality I love because that. it's within my belief system right it's within my values it's within my beliefs and I really feel like our values and beliefs lead us into whatever our spiritual practice is my spiritual practice is a lot around supporting myself to become who I need to become to help with those changes right I'm not just casting spells because there's one for money here's one for luck here's one for whatever like there is you know in my rituals that are about my self-development my growth my evolution like those are my spells that I'm wanting to cast. I love that. I love that. So I did 
<laughs> I totally squirreled you on the tell us about yourself <laughs> as you were talking about being a mom and all these beautiful things that you are. Talk to me about your business and what you do in your business. So in my business, I work with women so that they can remember and regenerate and rewild who they were born to be. Oh, I love that. Rewild. Talk to me about rewild. Yeah. So rewilding is... Well, in nature, it is about allowing the earth to come back to its natural state, allowing the earth to reclaim its space, to grow in the way that it wants to grow. Like we look at um, in rewilding practices, they're like taking land that's been stripped or destroyed and allowing it to return to the state that it was before that devastation. And it's the same thing for, for us. It is allowing us to come back to our natural state of being. And sometimes I think people take that word wild and think that it, you know, um, th that you're going to be just this wild, unkempt, um, mm. you know, no kind of tempering, no, no control, like um, tearing everything apart person. But that's not actually what wild means. That's just, again, like manipulation, it's just kind of that intent, like that that um, description we've given to it. To rewild is to come back to the natural state of being. It's to come back to, like I call my kids, like wildlings, like they're free-range kids. Like when we're camping, they're just like wandering all around doing whatever. Like even Silas, he's like, he knows where to go for the toilet, for the kitchen to find me. Like I'm not apron stringing them or anything like that. It's And it's learning to shed all of those expectations, conditions, um, family, ancestral patterning, you know, the things that aren't yours as well, learning mm -hmm. to shed that and to actually go, who would I be without it all? Oh, yes. Like, how would I move? How would I dress? What would I talk about if none of that had any control over me or if I no longer allowed that to have control over me. Yeah. Um, That's the key, right? If I no longer allowed. And this is one of the things that is really so present in my life too, is I have to recognize, and it's part of, you know, all my circle training and all the stuff that I've been through is recognizing that women Oh, gosh, I don't know. How, I don't quite know how to put this out there, but women tend to forget that we have choices in things yeah. and we choose to allow something to affect us in a deep, heavy way, or we can allow it to make us feel lighter and happier. We have these choices. Do I want this or do I not want this? And so we can choose to carry our trauma. We can choose to carry these things. Or we can go, you know what, I'm done and start ripping the layers and pulling it off. So I loved how you talked about the family patterning because I've done so much work. You know, if you look back at the family lineage with women, right? And this is one of the things that I teach in my, in my circle, the path to grace is that when your grandmother is pregnant, your mother is in her belly and she's developing all of the eggs that are going to create you. So everything yeah. that grandma felt and grandma experienced, your mom experienced, and so did you. So if grandma doesn't clear it, and if mom doesn't clear it, guess what, girlfriend? It's on you. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, are you the woman that wakes up to that, that actually notices that? Because I know there are experiences that I have, and they have impacted me in a, or impacted elements of who I am in a deeper way than someone, well, in the same kind of way as someone who's had that experience in a more devastating way, mm -hmm. like had it have ha, has had more layers of trauma within that. And for me, it was like, ah, oh, so here's something I'm here to heal that's in my family's sphere, that I'm here to learn how to reclaim 
to embody you know I'm um I don't want to be triggering to anyone but I'm talking like around sexual wounding and um you know there is a lot of trauma in my mum's side of the family with that yep and I have some experiences but they're not that kind of like that they're not that kind of trauma and yet I notice the way that I've had them impact me almost in a similar way that they may have them. And so I, you know, I felt that and went, ah, oh, that's why this is so important for me to learn how to reclaim, even though it doesn't necessarily, like, doesn't necessarily seem like it's such a big thing to someone else. Like for me, it was more around like expectation and trust broken as opposed to their what they experienced but I felt it in my body similarly yes you know and that's where sometimes we have it we might be having experiences in our life and we're thinking why is this affecting me in this way Mm -hmm. it's like well look back that is exactly what I had to do and I because I like that you put it that way it's look back right And once I realized what epigenetics were and how that functioned within your life, I went, okay, so I was molested as a little girl for three years and I have to look and go, okay, is it just me or are there other generations in my family? What is happening with this? And even before I knew all of this, long before my spiritual journey, I remember being a teenager and I'm like, this is it. My children are never going to go through this. And I wish I had known more about this path when I was younger, because I would have raised my children in probably a, at least 180 degrees different than I did, but it was watching for all the signs and it was educating them early, right? Anything that touches a bathing suit, no one has a right to get near it. And if it makes you uncomfortable when mom does it, then you need to tell me mommy enough, we're done. Cause you know, you help bathe them and stuff when they're younger. And, but I always wanted them to have bodily autonomy over what was going on. You have a right to say, no, this makes me uncomfortable. Even if that means when we're playing squishy butt going up the stairs (laughs) (laughs) and you say to me, mom, seriously, that's enough. I might cry a little on the inside, but I wanted them to know that they had a right to tell an adult, no, don't touch me. Yeah. That's a big deal. Um, so you call yourself a witch and a feminine alchemist, which I love. So can you define to me what you consider a witch? So for me, a witch is, spells aside, a witch, <laughs> a witch is a woman who is choosing to come back into her her true nature is a woman who is choosing to commune with the earth is a woman who is choosing to stand up against the wounding to the feminine because the witch wound is the collective influence upon the shape of the feminine and the expression of the feminine and so I look to the burning times as part of what I describe a witch as and I look to what were all the things that were taken away that were suppressed, were placed in the sin bin and um, and we were told were no longer allowed. And any woman that is doing the work to reclaim any of those things, so we've got keeping your eyes up when you're being spoken to, like yeah. eye, direct eye contact, right? So a woman who's choosing to be in her power to be seen, to be a part of something, to not bow down, Um a woman who is choosing to allow her body to be expressed in the world and not just hidden away for fear that she's going to lure the male gaze. Um, And I'm just going to use like female and male and woman and man in this because that's where this originated in terms of the witch wound. Um, And it is a woman who is reclaiming her sexual nature because she was told that she was just a vessel for the man to receive his pleasure or to create children or ears, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. she is a woman who is reclaiming her right to know what the herbs do, what the plants do, to listen mm-hmm. to the seasons, um, to know what phase the moon is in and when to plant which seeds. She is a woman who know who is reconnecting to her ability to heal, 
to um, to support, right? The witch in the woods, women, some women would just go to drink a cup of herbal tea and be listened to, right? She's the midwife. That's the witch for me. It's not this person that's choosing witchcraft. It is the woman who's choosing to heal that collective wounding and step into her full power and no longer be hidden, suppressed, oppressed, pushed down, shut away, pushed into the shadow. I absolutely love this because for me, what this brings up, right? Because I, I literally just recorded a video today for the feminine and masculine energy. And so the way that you describe this to me is so beautiful because you're claiming witch as this beautiful feminine energy where someone who is initiated into a Wiccan tradition, someone who is doing witchcraft, that's more of a masculine structure because it's the, there's very specific rules, things that we have to do things in a specific way. And so I love how yours is more flowing and open and loving. Does that make sense? (laughs) Yeah, it's really archetypal. Like yeah. the witch for me is archetypal. It's an element of the feminine. I love that. Just yeah. in the same way that, you know, even within that, like I mentioned, like healer and midwife and medicine, you know, we've got medicine woman. These are all archetypes in the feminine. And for me, the witch is the one who is doing the work to like really shift that co- that collective wounding to a lot of those archetypes that fall within that I'm within her. I love that. So this, this, the the way that you described all of this, which I love, it reminds me of the, the way that somebody described the word, witch to me, right? W I T C H, which is woman in total control, honey. And I love that because it's not the control is that I'm controlling everything you're doing. It's control as an empowerment. I'm empowering myself to do these things because I'm stepping into that energy. Does that make sense? Yeah, because who was the witch in the burning time? She was the woman who was challenging or uh, she wasn't necessarily choosing to challenge the status quo, but she was seen as challenging the way that the patriarch, the, the men that wanted power were trying to create the order they desired. Yes. So that they could stay in power. She challenged that. The medicine woman, the healer, the herbalist, she challenged the male-led medical system because she had people like they not that not all their stuff worked right. <laughs> Allopathic way, not everything worked. And we see that today as well. Not everything works. And yet she could help people and so well that must be witchcraft you must be consorting with something else if i couldn't fix it then you're you're doing something evil Mm. and so we must snuff that out right that goes under the under the umbrella of you're a witch cast her out yeah and and you know the sad thing is is that we know documented all these years later that not everybody who was burned or killed or hanged or crushed under a rock, they were not all witches. No, some were old women that had property that they wanted, but the woman wouldn't sell the property, right? A widow that wouldn't sell the property so that they could have it. So let's find some way to, to claim her as witch, right? The, I haven't read it, but the witch, the book, the witch's hammer that was written to identify a witch Oh, I haven't. Um, it's, I like. I really want. I need to go and read it. Even though Lisa Lister has told, like, said in her book, which that it will make me very, very angry to go read it. But well, and that's I why I haven't started. I tried to start reading it, and I just got so mad. I'm like, nope. <coughs> <laughs> you got to be ready to channel that into something, right? Yeah. And but it all of the things in there are essentially what a woman is in her natural na- in her natural state. Yes. Yes. I love that. So in your business, what do you do to help women reclaim, to rewild? What kind of, if I came to you as a client, what could I look to you to say, Natasha, I want you to help me with whatever this is. What kind of services do you offer to people? Um, so I work with women in two ways. One is through my program, my group programs, and one is one-to-one in coaching. And the big focus with it is 
Um, a lot of it is womb work and calling her to understand her womb first because mm. our womb is this beautiful blueprint of who we're being in any given moment. Our womb, I love this quote, and I always come back to this quote, and it's that at menarche, so our first bleed, a woman meets her power. Throughout her menstruating years or her bleeding years, she practices her power. And at menopause, she becomes her power. And so this is this beautiful life, death, rebirth cycle that is taking place within our body every month, giving us an opportunity to practice. Who am I being? And the womb is not just this physical cycle. It shows us about what's happening in our mental body, what's happening in our energetic spiritual body, what's happening in my emotional body. Who am I choosing? Like, what's showing up for me when I'm in my maiden phase? Am I being carefree? Am I allowing myself to try things out? Am I allowing myself to follow my ideas and bring them into creation? Am I able to step past the obstacles that are getting in the way? Or, or do I say yes to all of the things and then overburden myself? Like in my mother phase, am I only being the nurturer or am I actually allowing myself to be the juicy sexual being that, you know, because sex is how we become mothers yeah um you know am i it, it shows us every single month like the shadow and the light of ourselves and each phase has invitations of why those things are happening in the shadow of the light and how we can then create adjustments in us to support us in our psyche to support us in in claiming our power and that happens all through our life and then we've got so many women who are um, artificially influencing this cycle as well. And this is really co a really cool piece of information for women who are looking for partners, that if you are on birth control, your pheromones are different. And so you may actually mismatch with a man because your body's looking for someone who's a match to create children when you're looking for a partner. I didn't that, know that. That's the primal instinct. And we've got so many women on birth control. What's happening with our divorce rates? Yeah. They're like 50% in the US. Like we've got women who are coming through into their wild woman years, their perimenopause and um, years, who the children have flown the nest. They maybe aren't using birth control by the stage either. Maybe they're not even having a lot of sex by now too, which is probably part of the reason they stopped using as much, stopped using the birth control or they've had a whole lot of things going on with their wombs and had them taken out and all of a sudden their partner, the energetics, it's different. Mm -hmm. It's true. And yeah. Like I remember when I, when I met my husband, my ex-husband, like I wasn't on birth control and it was like this primal draw in and we created <laughs> created our our eldest in that that first meeting wow you know it's it's interesting to me listening to you talk about this it's where you know we meet our power when we first you know when we first have our periods and I immediately flashed to, I remember when I first got my period, I was in eighth grade. I went to the dance, came home and went, oh my God. And I went and told my mom and I was, you know, my mom decided that she wanted to call my dad and my grandmother and tell everybody, oh, she became a woman. I was mortified, mortified. I wanted to bury my face and just not even look at anybody. And I didn't want to tell anybody because this is what we've done to women as they grow up. It is something to be embarrassed of. Don't talk about this. And it never occurred to me that even at that point in my life, I was, I was squelching who I was as a female, squelching who I was as a woman, because I didn't want people to know about that. Yeah. And so I, I wrote down, I'm like, oh, I got to go do some meditation work to go back and heal that moment. Yeah, well, these are all our rites of passage. Oh, look, my video's just gone off. Fix that up again. These are all our rites of passage. So 
the lifespan or the life of a woman is a shamanic journey. It is every, so that menarchy, that's that first initiation into being a woman, right? And into that practicing of power. And everything that occurs at these rites of passage is what we are invited to harvest the medicine from. So if you experienced embarrassment, then mm-hmm. part of the for you or the place for you to heal is where, where are there places within the feminine that I'm embarrassed about it? If I was to, if I'm trying to share something with the world, do I find that I'm feeling bad? Like, is there embarrassment tied to that? Right. Right. And, and the same thing with each of our children that we have, or if you are someone who doesn't have children, you can look to things like the first house, the career. Those are all mother activities as well that we do, big things that we do in our life to birth into the world, our businesses. Um, each pregnancy, labor, and birth is a rite of passage, and it teaches you something about yourself. So in one pregnancy and labor, in your labor, you might learn trust. In another, you might learn, say, surrender. And maybe you didn't do those things, right? But you get to say, okay, I didn't do that, but what would I have needed? Uh, Okay, I needed to trust my body because I didn't and I was looking to everyone else to tell me what to do or how to support myself then. And so trust. That's something I need to learn about the feminine, about my body, about the natural processes of my body. And all of these things that we harvest from our initiations, those are the things that support us in perimenopause when we are shifting into becoming our power because those are all a part of our full embodied power as a woman. And we've had these experiences to call our attention to them. And if women knew this, this is what we are working on remembering, what, I, what I'm what i supporting women to remember and reclaim is that if we actually looked at our lives as these shamanic, magical journeys mm-hmm. and we knew to harvest that medicine from each of our births to go, all right, I learned this from this one. Like I did this intuitively or instinctually with between my um, second and third birth. I was not happy with my second birth. It was meant to be a home birth. But I'd kind of gone in really arrogantly and like, oh, well, I did it all great the first time. And I'd done so much work the first time, like really understanding natural birth and active birth and everything. And it was like a home birth in a birth, beautiful birthing center. Like It was like I was in a queen size bedroom. And with my second, I didn't do any of that. I just went, oh, well, I already know it. And I then didn't trust myself either when my labor stopped and realize, you know, I didn't go, oh, actually, maybe I wasn't in proper labor and that was just pre-labor and we just got to wait this. But we went to hospital and I ended up on my had, having an epidural because the pain became something I couldn't work with. I was out of my beautiful birth space and all these things. And so I learned from that, okay, here's what I didn't do that I really would have benefited, benefited from, that really would have served me. And I brought that into my third birth. And it was this beautiful three-hour home birth. Amazing. And, you know, from that second birth to the third, like it was Ben's first, he wasn't at Madeline's birth because we lived in different countries. He didn't know what to do to support me with Lucas' birth because we didn't have any conversations. We didn't even talk about it, right? I was just like, well, I'm going to do it all. Independent woman. Um, and so he didn't know what to do to support me. And then in the third, I made sure he did. I even gave him like a checklist. I'm like, okay, here's some things that if you get lost in it, just come back to this. And like, I didn't have to tell him a thing. He just listened to my breathing. He fed me sips of water, made sure I was like, he massaged my back. He knew I had this oil made up and would put that on. Like he just did it because I we had conversations and prepared him and then he wasn't there in the fourth birth and I birthed on my own. But, you know, each of those things, like I I learned something from them and those are going to be my tools when I come into perimenopause to support mm. me with brushes, to support me with learning how to become responsibly carefree. In the maiden years, we are carefree. In the mothering years, we are responsible. In the perimenopausal years, we are learning carefree, uh, sorry, 
responsible carefreeness, I want to say. Like we're learning to be carefree but still be responsible. And then in the crone years, we've become um, carefree responsibility. We really oh. step back into that. It actually mirrors the maiden in our crone years of like, yeah, I'm just here in the world again, but I know that I have a responsibility to support the next generation coming through still. And, I love that. And this is medicine that I really want to instill in women, and a lot of it is not having to be taught it but recognising that it's actually instinctually, innately within you. You mm-hmm. just need to learn the processes to activate it to be able to unearth it, to de-rubble all the conditioning and the expectation and come back into practice with yourself. I love that. Amazing. I like I I I literally feel like I now need to just, like sit down and have this whole conversation with my womb space because, you know, I my first pregnancy I lost a child. My second pregnancy full-term birth second, you know, third pregnancy, full-term birth, fourth pregnancy, full-term birth, but they were all three completely different experiences. And then um, because of, and I'm a firm believer of dis-ease, right? So I was diagnosed with endometriosis after my second pregnancy. Um, And so I know that a lot of the sexual trauma I experienced totally affected that area. And I wound up having a hysterectomy in my mid thirties. So I'm here at 53 and I haven't had a physical womb in a long time, but I'm sitting here thinking, I really need to have this nice meditation, a long conversation with my womb space to work through a lot of this stuff that I, Natasha, honestly, I never would have even thought of if we hadn't done this interview. Yeah, it's really, um, you know, because each of those things, like the first time that we touch ourselves, the first time that we look at our blood the first time that we have sex or have it pushed upon us like those are all a part of what we've been initiated into and if we ignore the medicine if we even if we hadn't haven't had an experience like we've had a traumatic birth or we've had a traumatic sexual experience we can still look at that and say okay what can I receive from this and if I can start practicing that now I'm going, to have, I'm going to save myself from having to repeat the cycle or having it energetically show up in my body as disease. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So this is how women heal their wombs. This is yeah. how we, we shift what is going on within the womb space. It is, you know, I, one of my clients, um, she's given me permission to share this whenever I need to share this, but, you know, in her family, women talk about their periods as a curse. And they're heavy and they flood and they're painful and they have migraines and they can't do anything. Um, They're flat out in bed, exhausted and drained. And through this practice of reclaiming her womb and her cycle, she's been able to bring more regularity to it, to be able to, um, she's working towards loving it. She, She reveres it now. She honors it. She doesn't doesn't flood in the same way she can actually manage her bleeding now without feeling overwhelmed by it and like that's from a woman who the next step given to her would be hysterectomy but she wanted to reclaim that she made that choice and it's and she's reversed these symptoms right and we know like louise hay talks about this like Mm -hmm. you can heal your life you can heal what is occurring in your body they are all energetic imprints. And with the menstrual cycle, it is um, all of these things that occur around feminine wounding and the way that we are open and accepting of these parts of ourselves. Absolutely. So it's interesting to me, and we only have a few minutes left. Like, I can't believe this has gone so quickly. And this is what happens every every time I do a podcast. It goes so fast. Um I'm really interested in how did you go from a personal trainer into this most amazing, not that being a personal trainer wasn't amazing, but everything you've described to me in the last 50 minutes has been phenomenal. So I'm curious, how did you go from personal trainer to where you are right now? Just in case anybody else decides, hey, let me get down this path. Yeah, so I have had spirituality in my life um, since I was a child, um, 
I was always, you know, taking all the lawn clippings and making my little witch's cottage outline on the ground and making my potions and things like that. Um, my mum also learned to read tarot when I was a child, but we had to hide it away from my dad because he didn't approve and he thought it was all BS. Um, so that was all resting within me. But I did go down a very analytical, logical, left-brained, it's left brain, isn't it, for that stuff, um, path, like the masculine part of me, because I do love that. I'm a Scorpio. I love this that kind of analytical stuff, which is where sports massage and personal training and those sorts of things really fit into that for me. But it was between, so I was still personal training through my pregnancy with Kayla, my third um, and began again like a few, couple of weeks after she was born. But then we moved from Perth to Melbourne and I decided that I wasn't going to do it here. And I got rid of pretty much all of my gear that I didn't need for just myself. And it was here in Melbourne when I wasn't, I was working with essential oils and I was sharing that with the world and I had a business around that, which I loved but it was more so based on the sustainability, the natural health and wellness and, um, you know, all my all my witchery, like creating all my own products and things like that. And then I had a crisis point in 2018. Kayla was about two and I was fed up with being at everyone else's service, feeling like I was only a mum, not having my work respected, like, you know, my part, husband coming home saying, well, what did you do today? And I'm like, well, I've been working, trying to build my business and him just not seeing the value in it and all those mm -hmm. sorts of things. And I, I was standing at the kitchen sink and I was just like, there has to be more than this because I felt so dissatisfied and, and unfulfilled and angry and resentful. Yeah. And yet I was putting on this beautiful face outside of doors and I'm, you know, and in my business and all those sorts of things. And I thought, right, how can I just create a shift in the everyday things I'm doing when I'm vacuuming, when I'm washing dishes? And I started listening to ebooks. Mm -hmm. I got Audible and I listened to a book by Gabby Bernstein and it's like, yep, that's good. And then like a suggestion came up for Rebecca Campbell's um, Rise, Sister Rise. It's right here. Oh. I, haven't actually read, I haven't actually read the physical copy because I listened to it on ebook, audio book, but I wanted the physical copy because this was life changing for me. And in here, she describes a ritual that she was doing um, to initiate her before her wedding. And it was a maiden mother crone ritual that she was walking through those different layers. And she tied that then afterwards, she shares in the book around the phases of the menstrual cycle. But when she was, when I was listening to her speak about that ritual, something landed in me and I remembered and I'm like, that's what's not in my life. And that's what was in my life, like in my past lives, like that's who I was. I need that. And that there bringing a more spiritual element to all of the work I was already doing with the earth and sustainability and personal development and growth and emotional support, all those beautiful things I was doing with essential oils brought it into a whole new layer within me. And I just followed it. I just followed it. We'd gone, we went to Asia for six weeks and I just spent that time like chewing up all these books and re and sh creating the pivot for my business where I was going to teach women to come back into communion with themselves and really start understanding themselves on a spiritual level, weaving the other pieces in. And then I found Sistership Circle. Because I thought, okay, I need to, I want, I want to bring back women's circle. And so I got the handbook. And then when we got that while we we're away, and when I returned home, the How to Lead Circle course was coming. Mm. And so I was like, I've got to do this. I have to do this. And it was the most I'd ever spent on a program before. And like, I'm talking US dollars, Australian dollars. <laughs> they oh, don't yeah, match yeah. up very well as well. And I was like, I've got to do it. I've just got to do it. And the conviction in me, my husband, he was just like, okay, then if you really got to do it, you got to do it. Like, he didn't even blink at it. And I've run through the whole path with them as well. But that was what taught me how to shed the masks. Yes. To expose myself, like who I really am and get comfortable with that, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And it kind of like the rest is history. Like I just kept following the threads. Like I have that, that womb piece that came in, that archetypal journey of the woman, that spiritual journey that we move through to meet our power. 
that there is the core thread I come back to. That is a core piece within my medicine. And so I just keep expanding upon it, developing more language from it, trusting that when things come out, when I say them, it's because I already knew them. I didn't have to learn them and just say it, even if you didn't learn it somewhere. Like you don't have to validate that this is the truth because it's coming through you. Mm -hmm. And that's like where I've come to. I love that. I, um, you know, I, I share openly and honestly with all of, all of the women who come into my circles that had it not been for what I went through with Sistership Circle, because obviously that's where I met you, I am beyond grateful. Oh, your little one. Please come. Do you want to take this? I am beyond grateful for that program because the amount of things that I've been able to do to work with myself, to change my relationship with women, I am forever grateful for Tanya Lynn, for opening Sistership Circle, for having all of those programs because it altered my life immeasurably in a way that I would never change. I am grateful for every moment, every experience that I had in the programs because I have some lifelong friends now and I never thought that I'd be able to have those kind of relationships with women and I owe it to that program. And now I'm able to carry it out into my own women's circles and watch women develop relationships in the same way. Such a beautiful blessing, truly. Yeah, it's, you know, it's really activating work. Like it's a catalyst for, for the change that needs to occur in the world. Um, and I weave circle into everything I do, even in like my training program, Wild Feminine Alchemy, where I teach women how to do this work and how to learn how to do it in a way that is aligned with their personal medicine as well. Like I give them all the tools and the containers and then they actually they fill them up with their own personal wisdom. Um, like circle was a big part of that. Like it's yeah. not just, you know, you're not going to come in and just have lectures from me. Like you, you're going to come in and you're going to learn how to transmute this within yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so it becomes your own. It becomes unique to you. It becomes flavored with your own understandings and perspectives and what you're here to do in the world as well. Because we're not all here to do it in exactly the same way that I am or um, you are. You know, we all have a specific thread we've chosen to come in and influence here. I agree. I love it. We are almost at the end of our time. Actually, we're a little over, but it's okay. I don't mind. I'm happy <laughs> about it. So is there anything, any last bits of wisdom or information that you want to share with the listeners for um, just anything that you would want to share? So the word conviction has come in. Oh, I love that. Whatever you choose to do to follow, do it with conviction. If you hold conviction for who you're here to be, what you're here to speak about, what your values are, what your beliefs are, if you hold conviction for all of them, you'll never be afraid to speak it because mm -hmm. instead you will feel, I can't not. Yeah, And it's in conviction that we overcome fear. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. Gives me all the chills. So how would someone who is listening, if they wanted to get into contact and work with you, how would they do that? So they can find me on Instagram, um, wild underscore feminine underscore magic with a K. Or you can come and join me in the Temple of the Wild on Facebook. And that is a free temple that I have open where I share my wisdom. I do um, soul tarot card readings for my community there as well. And which you're um, brilliant open, at, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Um, open up conversations and just drop all those little tidbits in there. Um, and then the next option is to step into one of my programs. Um, if you're a woman who's in spiritual business and you're really wanting to learn how to amplify your voice and get more visible and seen. It's that beautiful weaving together of the inner journey and how you choose to show up um, in Sacred Sorceress, my monthly membership, or um, as I mentioned before, Wild Feminine Alchemy is coming up soon. And that's a, it's a nine-month program that begins actually with my signature program, Womb Witch. 
where we are really dropping into a journey of liberating the feminine. And then you go into the um, practitioner elements of being able to lead journeys like that with women in wild feminine alchemy. Um, and yeah, and I train women in soul terror as well. I'm loving doing that at the moment. So if they want to sign up for those programs, they go to your website. Yes. Um, so just come and have a conversation with me on Facebook or on Instagram. Okay. Um, my website at the moment, I, I have a lot of like I'm between two spaces. And so it needs a lot of updating at the moment. Um, so the best place is to come and have a conversation with me and I can give you the up to date links. Um, because busy mama four who does all her own website development and landing pages. We and do, I get it. Sometimes I don't quite get to the updating old stuff part. And so I could direct you to natashadobney.com, but you're going to find all the past evolutions of and not the most <laughs> juicy, recent, potent, powerful versions of. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natasha, for taking time out of your day, especially as a busy mom to sit and spend time with me. I mean, for me, it's easy. It's evening time, but it's right in the middle of your morning and day for you. I am so grateful for you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, thank you for having me here. It is, oh, I get off on having these conversations. So like you've just set me up for the rest of the day. <laughs> Yay, me too. I love this. Like I could have kept going. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is my, uh, yeah, this is my place of passion and desire. So awesome. You. Well, thank you so much. I truly, truly appreciate you and your energy and for being here. Thank you. Mwah.